welcome back everybody to today's study on Ecclesiastes 5. For those of you who are new here, my name is Emma. I am the one that runs this YouTube channel as well as the written and Instagram blog Tea and God. And we we have fun here, you know, we sip our daily cup of tea, which I don't have the tea bag for, so my apologies. Uh, we have our daily cup of tea, we have our psalm of the day, and then we do our typical study on scripture, whatever that chapter is for the day. But uh, yeah, I hope you guys enjoy this video, and today is going to be on Ecclesiastes 5. So before diving into our psalm for the day today, I just want to spotlight our tea of the day today, which I'm having in this fantastic, adorable little teacup here, which fun fact, this is the first teacup that I ever bought, and I love her still so much. Um, but I don't actually have the tea bag on me, it's, it's over there. But it is the Tezo brand, I think, their honey lemon cake one. It's an herbal tea, and I've been wanting to try it for, like, at least two years now. And I just keep telling myself, like, you have tea at home, you don't need to buy more tea. Because really, I don't need to buy more tea. But, you know, I, I bought it anyways, and uh, it's amazing. Also, technical term is the glazed lemon loaf. I may have said that wrong before. I just realized I haven't bought the bag I steep sitting there. But anyways, <laughs> so it's awesome. I'll have a link down below for you guys, but it's the best. So before diving into Ecclesiastes 5, I want to first start us off in a word of prayer and then dive into our psalm for the day. So if you guys will bow your heads with me here really quickly. Dear Lord, thank you so much for today. Thank you for the kind of gloomy, cozy weather outside. Thank you that you know, we're all here together ready to study your word and please open our hearts to what you are trying to tell us today and please help me to say what you want me to say and help only what is you to come through in the final cut of this filming session and please help everyone watching this to have an amazing rest of their day. And in your name, Lord, we pray. Amen. So, diving into Psalms for, for our Psalm of the Day. Our Psalm of the Day is Psalm 98, which says... Oh, sorry. Um, before beginning, I am just using a New Living Translation Bible. I have a single column journaling Bible, so it's got... I'll show you guys in just a second. Out of the New Living Translation, Psalm 98 says, Sing a new song to the Lord, for he has done wonderful deeds. His right hand has won a mighty victory. His holy arm has shown his saving power. The Lord has announced his victory and has revealed his righteousness to every nation. He has remembered his promise to love and be faithful to Israel. The ends of the earth have seen the victory of our God. Shout to the Lord all the earth. Break out in praise and sing for joy. Sing your praise to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and melodious song, with trumpets and the sound of the ram's horn. Make a joyful symphony before the Lord, the King. Let the sea and everything in it shout his praise. Let the earth and all living things join in. Let the rivers clap their hands in glee. Let the hills sing out their songs of joy before the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with justice and the nations with fairness. So, sorry, I had I had this page bookmarked and it was funky looking. But again, this is just a single column journaling Bible. So it's got a single column down the middle. It's got space on the sides for notes or for journaling. Because I know some people do art in these. I just, that's, it's too busy for me to have my daily one. But anyways, um, this one is specifically a Tyndale Bible and I love it. So diving right into Ecclesiastes 5, starting in verse 1, it says, the title is Approaching God with Care. So starting in verse 1, it says, as you enter the house of God, keep your ears open and your mouth shut. It is evil to make mindless offerings to God. Don't make rash promises and don't be hasty in bringing matters before God. After all, God is in heaven and you are on earth, so let your words be few. Too much activity gives you restless dreams. Too many words make you a fool. And I just ended there at verse 3. So I wanted to jump back up to verse 1 for a second here. First one is talking about how we need to keep our ears open and our mouths shut. And I think that this is something really important for each of us to remember, not only in our relationships with other people, but especially in our relationships with, relationship with God. Because I feel like so often it's easy for us to pray without listening to what God is saying, or it's easy for us to give God our list of wants and kind of treat him like Santa Claus, you know? give him this list of, I want this, 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 and this, thank you, thank you for giving these things to me, whatever. But that's not how a relationship works. If you're constantly just 
demanding things of the other person in the relationship, it's not a very healthy relationship. So when it comes to going into prayer or any type of conversation with God, we really want to make sure that we're listening more than we're speaking is essentially what this is saying. And then continuing into verse 4, I'm going to do verse 4 through 7. It says, When you make a promise to God, don't delay in following through. For God takes no pleasure in fools. Keep all the promises you make to him. It is better to say nothing than to make a promise and not keep it. Don't let your mouth make you sin. And don't defend yourself by telling the temple messenger that the promise you made was a mistake. That would make God angry, and he might wipe out everything you have achieved. Talk is cheap, like daydreams or other useless activities. Fear God instead. So I want to highlight both verse 2 and verse 4, because both of these are really reminding us that if we tell God that we're going to do something, if we make a promise, if we make a vow to God, we really need to follow through with that. And this is something, obviously, that we should be portraying in our regular daily life but especially so when it comes to promises and vows we make to the God of the universe. If we say that we will commit to this thing that he's kind of guiding us towards and been nudging us to do, and then we don't follow through with it, that's not good. (laughs) That's not good. If we tell God we're going to do something, we need to be faithful in doing that thing and following through with it. And verse 7 when when I first read when I initially read this, my brain immediately went to the Hank Williams Jr. song, uh, "A Little Less Talk, A Lot More Action." So, like this song, we like the song, like verse seven. We need to make sure that we're having a little less talk and a lot more action. And whether that is in our faith life, whether that's t- leaping when God says to leap for something, or whether that's in your literal like decisions and goals that you have in your life. If you want to lose weight rather than just talking about, yeah, I'm going to lose 20 pounds. What, okay, how are you going to do that? What steps are you taking to make sure that you're doing that? Make sure that you're someone that your word is worth something and that when you say you do something, you do because otherwise your talk is cheap and that's not, you know, you want people to value what you have to say but in order for them to do that, you need to show them that you're worth what your words are. So starting in the next section of this chapter, it's called the futility of wealth. So starting in verse eight, it says, don't be surprised if you see a poor person being oppressed by the powerful and if justice is being miscarried throughout the land for every official is under orders from higher up and matters of justice get lost in red tape and bureaucracy. Even the king milks the land for his own profit. And I think that this is that verse eight is important because it reminds us that even then, even when this was written, oppression was still a thing. And while I feel like a lot of the oppression that's talked about, at least in American culture nowadays, um, is not really oppression, and a lot of times I think it's an over exaggeration of a situation. At the same time, I think that we all need to realize that on this side of heaven, we're never going to be able to completely obliterate oppression. That's just not not going to happen. That's not how human nature works. And until we are all perfect people, which we never will be because that's impossible for us on the side of eternity, we're always going to have oppression in some way, shape or form. And so I think that it's better to accept that and move on and find ways to make it better than try to obliterate oppression, make it just completely gone because completely eradicate it. That's not going to work. We're not going to ever be able to completely eradicate oppression until we are in heaven. So Y'all buckle your seatbelts and just be patient, all right? But I think in verse 10, it says, Those who love money will never have enough. How meaningless to think that wealth brings true happiness. The more you have, the more people come to help you spend it. So what good is wealth except perhaps to watch it slip through your fingers? And I think that verses 10 and 11 are really important because, again, the world tells us to focus on wealth. The world tells us that money is everything, that money is the root, is the way to get happy, that you'll never be happy until you have this amount of money because then you can buy this, 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 and this, and that will make you happy. And that's, that's not the case. Whether you have little or much, you're going to be as happy as you are now because happiness is a choice whether or not you want to accept that. I shouldn't say happiness. Joy is a choice because happiness is something that's like, you know, a kid on Christmas Day. Joy comes in when happiness is forced to leave the room. You can have joy in even the most hopeless and desperate situations. You just have to choose joy in that moment. I also think that it's really important for us to remember not to focus on money or fret over money. Because 
again, like society says, money's gonna solve all our problems. That's not a true narrative. The only thing, way that our problems are gonna be solved is if God solves our problems. Obviously, it's gonna take some work on our end to solve a problem, but ultimately, a problem can only be solved if God wants it to be solved. And that's not to say that God's harming you purposefully and that he's making your life awful and all these things, because that is because we live in a fallen world. All I'm I really saying- I wanna focus on verse 12 really quickly because I think it's important for us to recognize that being exhausted is not necessarily a bad thing. Personally, I've been feeling the exhaustion train lately. I mean, life is chaotic and I have a lot going on, which I'm sure is true for at least some of you, if not all of you, because whether you're still in lockdown or not, that obviously plays into a factor like our state is, but I have a job that allows me to work during lockdown. Anyways, that's not important. I think it's important for us to realize that being exhausted isn't necessarily a bad thing because man, does being tired help you sleep. Like the verse is essentially saying that if you are never doing anything, you're not going to be tired enough to get a good, good night's sleep. When you're exhausted, like it is so easy to fall asleep and just like sleep because your body needs it. So I think in that sense, exhaustion kind of sucks, but it's also not that bad. So then continuing into verse 13 it says, there is another serious problem I have seen under the sun. Hoarding riches harms the saver. Money is put into risky investments that turn sour and everything is lost. In the end, there is nothing left to pass on to one's children. We all come to the end of our lives as naked and empty handed as on the day we were born. We can't take our riches with us. And this too is a very serious problem. People leave this world no better off than when they came. All their hard work is for nothing, like working for the wind. Throughout their lives, they live under a cloud, frustrated, discouraged, and angry. And again, I really think that verse 13, verse 13, sorry, through 17 are important because it's reminding us to spend less time focusing on money, focusing on our income, focusing on our net worth, and rather focusing on the things that actually matter long term. And I'm talking like eternity long term. I'm talking about how we need to be focusing on how can we better love God and better love the people around us because ultimately those are the only things that are going to continue on is our faith and is our relationships with people and I think we often forget that and we often think oh man well you know I just need to work a little bit harder because then I can do this and then I can do that but a lot of those things if not all of those things are not going to last. You're not gonna be able to take a nice house with you. You're not gonna be able to take a nice garden with you or a nice car or spouse or, I don't know, well, I mean, if your spouse is also a Christian, you'll both go to heaven, but you know what I mean? Like, it's not like finding these things that we all idolize, whether we want to admit it or not. Not It's not in finding those things or in uh, receiving and getting those things. That's not what we should be focusing on. It's focusing on how can I better love God in this moment? How can I better love my neighbors, my coworkers, my family members? That's what we should be focusing on and not so much on the, how much money can I get out of doing this? That's not what's important because that's not what's going to last. But diving into the last section of this verse, of this verse, sorry, of this chapter is verses 18 through 20, which say, even so I have noticed one thing at least that is good. It is good for people to eat, drink, and enjoy their work under the sun during the short life God has given them, and to accept their lot in life. And it is a good thing to receive wealth from God and the good health to enjoy it, to enjoy your work and accept your lot in life. This is indeed a, di a gift from God. God keeps such people so busy enjoying life that they take no time to brood over the past. And yet again, I love Ecclesiastes because it's constantly reminding us to enjoy our lot in life, whether it's, you know, the best or not the best. Enjoy what we have while we have it. And I think that it's so important because if we don't enjoy our life in this moment, oftentimes there's something that we are doing that's holding us back from enjoying the life in the moment. Whether we're forcing ourselves to think like a pessimist and to focus on all the negative in life, that could very well be part of it. Or it could be, you know, that you hate your job. Okay, can you apply for another job? And if you get another job, will that change your mental stat, your mental health? You know, like, will that make things easier for you. If you feel like you don't have a good group of girlfriends, okay, how can you fix that? It, are there groups of women that regularly meet at your church? And if there are, can you join them on the day or night that they meet? If there's not, or if it's a time when you can't go, okay, are you following girls on Instagram that you think are really cool and could be really great friends? Message them because chances are they're also looking to meet new girlfriends to have because, you know, especially in adulthood, I mean, 
I am entering, oh, I'm, I'm an, an emerging adult, but like even late high school, it's really hard to make friends. It's, it's not as easy as, as it is when you're all in the classroom together. In the real world, you basically have your coworkers to choose for, for your friend groups, and those are not always the best people to be friends with. So, like, if you want to make friends, make friends. If you are wanting to, if you, if you hate your home environment and it drives you crazy and you want to change it, okay, can you move the furniture around a little bit to make it fresh? Can you do a fresh coat of paint? Can you add a new plant? I don't know. Whatever it's going to take to make it feel fresh and new. Whatever it is that will make you enjoy your life a little more, try and do those things. And that's not saying that, well, I'm going to enjoy life more if I don't have to eat salads every day or if I don't have to work out or do whatever. I'm not saying to just throw your health out the window or to just completely treat yourself and indulge in everything because that's not healthy either. But, you know, I think it's important for us to remember that our life is short and that while we're here, we may as well enjoy it. Even if it means spending the extra two dollars on the box of tea that you've been wanting to try for a few years, you know, like do it. It's two dollars. Get over it. Like, I don't know. I just think it's important for us to remember that life is short and as easy as it can be to get stuck in this cycle of I need to work my butt off so that I can get this thing and just, you know, this endless cycle of work, 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 work. We need to remember to take time to enjoy life because Otherwise, trust me, time's gonna fly by and you won't know where it went. And I also wanna just quickly touch on that life is kind of up to you. Obviously, God is, obviously God is in control. But if you are living life as a victim and if you constantly play the victim card, you're always going to be a victim regardless of what happens in life, regardless of what decisions you're making that are playing into your own situation and your own life outcomes. If you're playing the victim card, you're always going to be the victim and you're never going to be able to take ownership for your life. And that, that my friends, is not what I want for any of you. In order to enjoy life, you have to take action. You need to have a little less talk and a lot more action to be able to get from where you are to where you're going. And if you have a victim mentality, it's going to be a lot harder. So I would really, 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 really encourage all of you to start taking ownership for your life. Start taking ownership that, you know, I am where I am because of some of the decisions that I've made. I understand, obviously, for those that are the younger people in my audience, you're living where you're living because you're living with your parents and they live there because of work or family or whatever. But you know what I'm saying. Your life is going to be the result of a lot of your decisions when you're an, an adult, a young adult, a midlife adult, an old adult. And by old, I don't mean like you're old when you reach a certain age. I just mean like uh, stages of life wise, like any, any stage. Yeah. Anyways, you know what I mean? Your life is kind of your responsibility. Obviously God is in control of everything and he is ultimately the authority in your life, but you need to be able to take action if you want to accomplish anything. You are going to need to take action because like it says, it's good for us to enjoy our lot in life and to enjoy our work and to enjoy our to toil and to enjoy the fruits of our labor. So I just want to quickly say too that your life is going to start when you decide you want your life to start. Your life is not going to start when you graduate high school or college or when you start college if you're in high school. Your life is not going to start when you meet the guy. Your life is not going to start when you reach a certain age that the younger you determined this was the age that my life really begins. Life starts when you take ownership over it and you decide that, you know what, I want to make these changes and I'm going to start today. Because ultimately, if you don't do that, your life is constantly going to be overrun by the victim mentality and by comparison and by so much pessimistic thinking that you are going to be in a deep dark hole. Trust me, I've been in the hole, I don't want to go in the hole again. So trust me, just take ownership for your life and start leaning into the leading that God is directing you towards. Which I could go on a whole other tangent on that. But anyways, <laughs> before I do, I should cut off this video here. But I just want to say thank you guys all so much for watching. I really hope that you guys learned something from today's study on Ecclesiastes 5. And if you did, please feel free to leave the video a like. It does really help push out the video to other people who might benefit from it. And if you know somebody in your life who you think could benefit from this chapter of Ecclesiastes, feel free to send this video to them as well. If you guys are interested in more content like this, please feel free to hit the subscribe button. Follow me on Instagram over at t.and.god and I will have the website linked in the description down below. But until I see you guys again, I hope you guys remember, if you gain nothing else from this, how loved, cherished, and precious you are to the God that created you. 
And yeah, I'll see you guys next time. Bye guys.